Hello, 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 hello. A very warm welcome to our sixth annual Summer Institute at the College of the Atlantic. My name is Beth Gardner, and I'm the chair of the board of the college. There's such excitement and anticipation in an, that accompanies an opening evening like this to an event. We, at the college, see ourselves as one of the thought leaders on the island. We're a small institution, but we love big ideas. This summer, our week-long festival of ideas will focus on the ocean. In a world that is so divided, the vast ocean unites the globe. We're so excited this year to be holding the, inst the Institute in collaboration with the National Geographic Society. Like all great things, the inspiration for this five-day event packed with experts at the top of their fields started as the kernel of an idea, dreamt up over a coffee in the back bay in Boston by a longtime close friend of the college, Judy Goldstein, and our former board chair, Will Thorndike. From that spark, we've worked tirelessly to build this summer institute into a force to, ex to exchange ideas, solve problems, educate ourselves. As you might imagine, putting together a program like this takes time. In fact, we began planning this very summer institute that we're opening this evening. <laughs> we plan for that too. <laughs> the day after last year's institute on food systems finished, a small group of us sat on a porch overlooking the water in a, on our glorious and our glorious and much loved 19th century stone building on campus called turrets. We started generating ideas, tossing around topics that, that would be engaging and important. Wow. Like magic, the answer floated in on the cool sea breeze off Frenchman's Bay. The ocean, in all its beauty and complexity, immediately seemed the perfect choice for the theme of this summer's institute. Also, the, the topic of the ocean is something that is deeply embedded in the curriculum of the College of the Atlantic. And so, without further ado, I welcome you to sit back, enjoy the ride, stay out of the rain, and I hope you enjoy this week as much as we have enjoyed putting it together. It's not going to rain. It's not going to rain. It's not going to rain. <laughs> 4.2 billion years ago, the temperature of the earth cooled to somewhere just below the boiling point of water, and it rained. And it rained for millions and millions of years. And those rains filled the low spots on the planet and created our ocean. A hundred million years later, Hydrothermal vents in our fledgling ocean floor catalyze the transformation of lipids, amino acids, carbohydrates, and RNA, and may have kick-started life itself. And that's what this celebration is all about. Those two things, the ocean and life's dependency on it. I'm Darren Collins, if you didn't know. I'm uh, an alum from the class of 1992 and the president. And I'm going to be the MC across the week, and I'm excited and honored to do that. I'll do my best to keep this kind of flowery philosophizing to a minimum. But it's important to establish this baseline of awe and reverence for our oceans. Awe and reverence. Some of it comes from magnitude. Our ocean is 325 million cubic miles of water over 71% of the planet's surface. Some awe and reverence come from what we've learned about the ocean. 
Some comes from how much we don't know. Some comes from beauty and a curling wave or a breaching whale. And some comes from the total horror and destruction of a hurricane. If people know, they're in awe of what the ocean provides. Food, climate stabilization, oxygen, medicine, joy, but there doesn't seem to be much reverence of late. The ocean is our greatest commons, and we're using it to death. I want us to come away from this week in awe and with renewed reverence. But as so much of the week is dedicated to solutions, I'd like you to come away inspired and prepared to do something. The Summer Institute is a way COA gives back to the MDI community and to the global community. It is an extension of how we practice human ecology at COA and how we approach massive, wicked problems through a collaborative, project-oriented, interdisciplinary approach. And it needs to be a way to move past talking and on to doing. What might happen in the wake of this year's event? That's what I keep thinking about. There are over 4,000 individual registrants across the week, smart, curious, resourceful people all coming together under the tent, thank God. <laughs> Think of how the possibilities multiply geometrically with the presence of our collaborators at the National Geographic Society. We are so honored and humbled to have had their help designing and executing this week. Think of the alchemy when you put Oceana, the Society for Black Archaeologists, the Billion Oyster Project, the Ocean Exploration Trust, COA, and all the other people and groups together under one tent. Institutionally, I'm excited for COA to really, really lean in to the projects and possibilities that emerge. We are the College of the Atlantic, after all, right? Um, as we do that learning this week, I want to be absolutely sure we walk, boat, and swim collaboratively alongside our partners of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, Micmac, and Maliseet tribes here in Maine. We gather on lands that were once theirs, and through generations of dubious exchanges, find ourselves on their territory. But we also gather alongside the geography and resources and spirit of Supec, ocean, in the Passamaquoddy and Maliseet language, Supec. We need to acknowledge these lands and resources, but we also must respond to these people's present and future needs where land and water is concerned. So, I'm fired up. I'm really, really fired up for this week. And I'm really excited to start the week with Tara Roberts and Justin Donovan. Dr. Justin Donovan is a marine archeologist and assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at UCLA. He's co-founder and board chairman of the Society for Black Archeologists. His research is situated in the former Danish West Indies, where he uses diving, archaeology, and community empowerment to understand and reimagine the cultural impacts of the slave trade, which saw 12 and a half million people violently abducted from their homes in Africa and brought to this hemisphere, and where at least 1.8 million people died in the journey. Their bones, boats, and histories swallowed by Supec, the ocean. How do we come to understand that horror? How do we make sure we never forget that disaster of humanity? And how do we mark and learn and build a better future for the African diaspora in the process? Justin will be speaking with the 2022 Rolex National Geographic Explorer of the Year, Tara Roberts. Tara studied at Mount Holyoke and NYU. She worked as the Director of Communications for Ashoka, the Institute of Social Entrepreneurship, and she was a social entrepreneurial coach for Red Bull, which I can't wait to talk to her about. <laughs> and she was named National Geographic Explorer in 2018. And I have to imagine the last three and a half years have been an absolutely amazing 
whirlwind for Tara, one perfectly captured in her National Geographic Society podcast, Into the Depths. So, I promise I'll keep it shorter next time, but I wanted to welcome you all, and I wanted to welcome Justin and Tara to the stage. Give them a Thank you all. Thank you for the invitation. Can you all hear me well in the audience? All right. Tara, it is so good to be here with you yeah, again. Yes, good to be there. <laughs> <laughs> we have a long history, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about during the course of this evening. We wanted to host this more of as a conversation as opposed to a formal presentation, in part because we've known each other for a few years now from before this even became a project till the point where we're sitting in front of you today. Uh, we would like to thank College of the Atlantic, uh, Darren and others for organizing this. Uh, we'd like to thank the alumni and the students for continuing to keep this university on the cutting edge of research, uh, of informed and purposeful driven education, and looking forward to the future and what can happen here as well. Um, and then again, of course, uh, to the Wabanaki as well for continuing to be the traditional stewards of this place. Uh, and hopefully their knowledge and tradition and understanding can help to inform what we do, not just here, but all over as well. We will be blessed by the rain in different degrees throughout the course of our conversation, so sometimes we may speak a little louder, um, but we hope it all works well. Yeah. Tara, sh yeah. Should I get into it? Yeah, let's go. All right. <laughs> Uh, so as Darren mentioned, I am Justin Donovan. I am an assistant professor of archaeology at UCLA. Uh, I was trained traditionally as a maritime or er, as a terrestrial archaeologist, and over the last six years, have been doing maritime archaeology. So I come from a wide variety of backgrounds. But as we'll begin to discuss, and as many of you know, a lot of these disciplines tend to be a little too constrained for what we need to do, and so we're constantly trying to break outside of them and rethink of new ways that we can begin to work. Uh, that deals with collaboration, with training, and with education as well. So with that said, I'll just have a nice little video to play while we talk a little bit about how this, this whole project came into being. Uh, I co-founded the Society of Black Archaeologists in 2011 with my colleague, now Dr. Ayanna Flewellen, who's at Stanford University. Uh, she was then an undergraduate student at the University of Florida, and I was a graduate student there. And we wanted to start an organization that would help to address some of the issues we had with diversifying the field of archaeology, and then potentially go beyond our borders and begin to think of what archaeology could look like across the African diaspora and the continent as well. We had no idea that we would eventually get into scuba diving. Uh, I could barely swim when we had these initial conversations. <laughs> and to say that I do maritime archaeology now is still kind of a, a pinch yourself moment. Um, but about six years ago, uh, we were contacted by members of an organization called Diving with a Purpose, which Tara, I'm sure, will be talking about a little bit later. And they reached out to us because they were a bunch of advocational scuba divers that had been working with the Smithsonian to map slave shipwrecks all over the world. They didn't know any African-American or African archaeologists, so they reached out to our organization and said, do any of you do maritime archaeology? Again, this is about six years ago. And we said, there's one of us. And we had never actually met them in person. Uh, so they said, well, if we train you how to do diving, would you train us how to do archaeology? And we said, I think we can put something together. So I, uh, I ferociously called Ayana. I said, Ayana, we're going to get ready to start scuba diving. Let's work on our swimming. And she thought I was crazy. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> and it probably was crazy. Uh, but there was a commitment from Diving with a Purpose. We had funding and support from the Slave Rex Project in the Smithsonian. And it led to what eventually became a multi-year collaboration to begin to do underwater archaeology of slavery and the slave trade. And as we'll talk a little bit later, actually moving beyond that to talk about all of our history and heritage that exists underwater. Um, so with that said, I'm going to pause there. And maybe perhaps have Tara talk a little bit about how she came into to being in terms of collaborating with us in this organization of Diving with a Purpose. Perfect. Yeah. And I get blessed by the rain. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so it is absolutely wonderful to be here. Can you all hear me? Can just a little louder? Okay. Oh. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Sound good now? Okay, great, great. 
Um, it is wonderful to be here. I have to say that this is my first time to Maine. So first time to Bar Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that I've noticed is that this town is full of super friendly, super kind people. So y'all, unlike Justin, I get a little nervous up here on stage. So I hope y'all bring like the friendliness and the kindness <laughs> um, while we're talking. So thank you. Um, so my introduction to this work was completely accidental. I'm gonna paint a picture for you. It was 2016. I was living in Washington, D.C. Um, I was working at the time for a nonprofit. I was their director of communications and it was a good job, and I was thankful for it. Um, frankly, because right before it, for the previous six years, I had run my own nonprofit on a shoestring budget, so I was just happy to have a regular paycheck and benefits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was really good. Um, but I felt like something was off, that I wasn't on purpose in my life. Can you guys still hear me okay? We're okay, okay. Um, I am a storyteller and a journalist by trade, but I wasn't telling stories. And this was also 2016 when issues of race had gotten to the forefront on the national stage. And my work previously had been around gender equity, which is still really important to me. But I wanted to do something around race, but I didn't know what to do or how to do it. Um, and I, I love the way, like, the universe gives you little nudges. And these little nudges that you don't think mean anything at the time, but then they turn out to be everything. So I got this little nudge to play hooky from work one day <laughs> <laughs> um, and to go and visit the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the museum that Justin just mentioned. Um, I'd never been to the museum before, but... I felt this need to go, so I went, and I took my time going through. Has, has anybody been to the museum? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible place. For those of you who haven't been, I highly suggest you go to DC, make time to go to this museum. But I go to this museum, and I end up on the second floor, which is a really tiny floor that most people skip. But again, I had that little nudge to go to this floor. So I go, and it's, it's an archival floor, so there are only a couple of exhibits on it. But one exhibit on it um, was, it was, uh, it was a picture, a picture of a group of primarily black women on a boat in wetsuits. I had never seen a group of black women on a boat in wetsuits before. So I was like, what? <laughs> Who are these people? What's going on? And I looked at the little placard about them, and it said that they were part of this group called Diving with a Purpose, and that part of their mission was to search for and help document slave shipwrecks around the world. I swear to you, this really happened. It didn't really happen, but it felt like it <laughs> happened. It was like the entire floor went dark, even though I was in a building, it felt like the sun was shining down a spotlight on the picture. It felt like the heavens parted and birds were sinking. <laughs> and those women on that picture, they were actually sitting down on the boat. But in my imagination, it was like they were standing up and they had their hands balled into fists and their fists were on their hips. It was like they had on capes and the capes were flowing in the wind. I could have sworn that they were superheroes. That's, that's what they look like to me. I was like, these women who look exactly like me are doing what work in the world? They're doing what? They are actually going out, finding our history, and helping to bring it back into memory. I just want to throw out a couple of stats here so that you like get the context of this work. And Darren gave you some of those stats in the beginning, but just to, to throw them out again. There were 36,000 voyages that brought 12.5 million Africans to the Americas. So 36,000 voyages. 
And they estimate that as many as a thousand of those ships wrecked. A thousand ships wrecked. But to date, less than 20 have been found and properly documented. So to me, it felt like there was a whole, a whole bit of our history that's just lost. It's just missing. So the work that these people were doing to bring that into memory felt so important to me, and it immediately made me want to be a part of it. And that other stat that Darren threw out, I, I don't know if you caught it, and I want to make sure that you catch this, because I didn't know this. This wasn't something taught to me when I was growing up. 1.8 million Africans lost their lives in the Middle Passage. Mm. Like, really, think about that number. Like, it wasn't 1,000 people, it wasn't 5,000 people, it wasn't 100,000 people, it was 1.8 million people that lost their lives in the Middle Passage. But where are the memorials to those 1.8 million people? Who's remembering them? Who's grieving them? So the work that these divers were doing, it felt crucial. It felt so important. So I called them up, and I was like, hey. <laughs> and they were like, hey, <laughs> come <laughs> dive with us. But I wasn't a scuba diver, and I also really wasn't um, somebody that often looked back at the past. Like, I'm a Star Trek fantasy girl. I, I want to go to the future. <laughs> um, and I thought that a lot of times the past, when stories are told about black folks' past, it's centered inside of our pain and inside of our trauma. Mm -hmm. So it often felt painful for me to look back. But the work that these divers was they were doing didn't feel like that. It felt new. It felt revolutionary. It felt really important. So I got um, scuba trained. Took me three months, and then I did my first ocean dive. And at that time, I still wasn't thinking about this as a story. I was just thinking that this work was important, and I wanted to be a part of it. But as I got to know the divers, I went on that first ocean dive, learned more about this history. I was just like, oh my god, I have to help tell this story. I have to help tell the story about them. So I ended up quitting my job. Um, I didn't have funding, I didn't have an assignment at the time, I just knew I wanted to be a part of this. So I did, um, and I ended up participating in their very first training in Florida, which is where I met this guy, <laughs> and he changed things for me. And I will say that I didn't have funding when I started, but I applied for a National Geographic Society grant and they gave me funding to go out and to be on the missions. Missions were happening in Mozambique, South Africa, Senegal, Costa Rica, St. Croix, and around the US. So I got the funding to be able to go out. And the first stop was to actually get the training to become an underwater archaeology advocate. And maybe Justin, you can yeah. share like, what is that? Yeah. And what does it mean to do like maritime archaeology? Definitely. First, I'll preface by saying you heard about quitting your job and playing hooky. I know there's a lot of students in the room. <laughs> Please don't do that unless you are prepared to do a lot of work on the back end. <laughs> but I would be remiss if, as a professor, I didn't go over what it is that we do as maritime archaeologists. And hopefully this slide will progress. There we go. So maritime archaeology, because I know we are like unicorns and few and far between, and this might be the only time you interact with a maritime archaeologist this week or <laughs> in the future. We study past human cultures with an emphasis on how we have interacted with the world's oceans, lakes, and river systems. So we also do a lot of work in lakes and rivers. Diving is not nearly as enjoyable, but it is equally as important. And we try to bring this history and heritage to life, not only for ourselves, but for others who don't have access to these, these areas specifically. Again, trained as a terrestrial archaeologist, Generally, we're taught to dig down and excavate physically in layers. I tell people when we do maritime archaeology, it's kind of like mapping a plane wreck. Uh, most of these wrecks tend to crash because they hit a reef, uh, or they spring a leak, or there's some type of event which causes them to sink over time. So oftentimes, most of our work is spent actually mapping underwater. Um, and for those of you who've never done underwater scientific work, we go down with regular number two pencils, uh, we have mylar paper, we duct tape it to a board, and we are sitting there with rulers and measuring tapes underwater, documenting everything from the marine life that's swimming by 
uh, as well as any anomalies or objects that we may locate underwater. Uh, we produced these pretty maps. This did not look like this when we mapped this. Uh, the visibility was roughly six, six inches, uh, so you could barely see your hand in front of your face. But, uh, but we, uh, we were able to pull this map off specifically doing work in St. John. And actually the funding to do this came from the Nat Geo money I received from being named an emerging explorer. So I don't think they realized that, but we thank you all for, <laughs> for pulling those funds together. All right. The other element to it, and perhaps the most recent excavation that I was on, uh, was earlier this year in May, and I helped to participate in the excavations of the Clotilda. And to bring it back full circle, the Clotilda was the last slave ship to enter the United States. It was located roughly two years ago off the coast of Mobile, Alabama, and people who came off of that ship founded a community called Africatown. <coughs> That community is still existing today. Uh, we, we went out in May and actually excavated it for the first time, mostly just doing preliminary assessment and coming back for later excavations. From those stories and those excavations, we were then able to get more information, and we'll be going out and collecting more oral histories and doing more archaeology. <coughs> yeah, we'll grab some water. Apologies. Yep. So the Clotilda was significant for a number of reasons. On the one hand, it's, uh, it's the last slave ship to come into the United States. On the other hand, we had a large interdisciplinary team coming of conservators, of archaeologists, historians, and storytellers as well. There'll be more work that we'll talk about as we continue to do the work, but uh, we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we move forward. And this might be a good pivot to some of the work that you've been doing with Nat Geo and storytelling. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one of the questions that I started out with was how do you tell, how do you really talk about this history? Like, it's history that, I don't know, it's not always the easiest history to step into, but it's important history. So, how do you talk about it? And when I started, I originally was planning to write blog posts about this work. Blog posts that are like 200, 300 words. Um, quickly, I realized that you can't talk about this history in that way. Um, Justin was actually really a key factor in me beginning to understand this history in a new way. I really hadn't been taught about the transatlantic slave trade. I don't know if you guys were, but I really wasn't. It was sort of a side note in my history books. But after following these divers, um, traveling around the world with them, talking to historians, talking to descendants, I began to understand the transatlantic slave trade in a new way. I'm sorry, I'm holding this closer so you can hear me, but it's making a little bit of noise. Okay, um, you said this to me, and I say this now all the time, and I have to be honest, I don't always attribute you when I say it, no, <laughs> but these are his <laughs> words. Um, well, this part is not, this, this, uh, these are not his words, but okay. I'll get to his words. There was a way that the world looked before the transatlantic slave trade, and there is a way that it looked after. It is one of the most monumental events in our history. But again, we treat it like it's a side note. But there were four continents involved. It's Europe, it's Africa, it's South America, it's North America. Wealth was created, wealth was destroyed, powers came into existence. Like it changed everything and it set the foundation for the society that we have today. And this is something that Justin said to me that I was like, Psh, I never thought about that either. But he said, imagine what it means to take 12.5 million people across the ocean. Like that very act, it changed coastlines, it changed landscapes. There's a way that the transatlantic <laughs> slave trade had an impact on our climate, on our world in a way that I'd never thought about before. So I felt like this was something to examine 
in a much, much deeper way, and that there's a way to talk about it that wasn't, again, centered in the pain and in the trauma. I talked to over 100 people from around the world, and I started to hear the story from their voices. We got all these accents from all these different places, all these different people with different perspectives. So I started to hear this as a podcast. And I went back to National Geographic, and I was like, hey, the blogs are great. <laughs> But I think there's a lot more to be done. And Nat Geo was down with it immediately. And they said, yes, let's do a podcast. So we ended up doing a six-part narrative podcast. Um, and I wanted to give voice to all of those people that I met around the way. And I also wanted to bring in adventure and exploration. So it's also like you know the, the podcast puts you in moments, um, in these different places. It takes you back in the past so you can hear shipwrecks. But it also tells the story differently. I'll just say this one last yeah. thing. Um, Justin, then we'll punt back to you. One of the questions that I had when I started out is, is there anything that changes when someone like me, someone like those divers who were in those pictures, have the agency to tell the story? And I think something does change. I think that when you, and this also is not my, I, I'm like, I'm an original person, but I am not original <laughs> with a lot <laughs> that I'm remembering here. There's an amazing Nat Geo explorer named Noel Koch from South Africa who says, I'm gonna butcher what he says, um, but the essence of it is if you want to tell a new story, change the storyteller. Mm. Right? To get the, yeah. <laughs> Like to change the story, you change the storyteller. Mm -hmm. So we had this group of people whose voices aren't widely heard on this topic. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give voice to them. Um, and what we found, what I found when I did my own thinking about how I wanted to tell this story, is I wanted to focus on the honoring of those people whose lives were lost. And I also wanted to focus on the healing. So I wanted to play two clips from the podcast so that you can get a sense of how we told the story differently. Um, and I'll just set up the first one. That one is, you'll hear my mother's pastor. His name is Bishop Jack. And my mother is really proud of the work that I'm doing and she always tells people <laughs> about it. So Bishop Jack came to visit her at her house and I was there, and she asked him to bless my journey. And Bishop Jack said something to me that transformed, I think, where we went with the podcast. Mm -hmm. He said that I had to ask the ancestors for permission to tell this story, and I had to ask for their blessing. And he said, for me to do that, I had to speak their names. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying that. He was like, you have to speak their names. And what I realized is that when we talk about this history, when we talk about the 1.8 million people who were lost, we often see them as faceless statistics. They're just bodies that were in a hold. But those were people who had names, who had lives. They were mothers, fathers, daughters. They had lives. And so what we try to do in the podcast is speak their names throughout. And of course, we'll never know their actual names, but we speak names that represent people from those regions from that moment in time. So I just want to play that um, that clip so you can get a sense of if it. You can get in tune with um, the essence, the spirit of those ans of our ancestors who were lost during that middle passage. Invite them, invite their blessing on the work. You can do so by your prayer meditation. You come across names, speak their names, speak the names, speak the names, and then ask them to bless you. Ask them for permission to tell the story. Ask them to go before you to make the way straight, smooth, and harmonious. Listen. I hold their stories in my arms. Stories from the depths of my ocean. I've memorized every inch of their heartbeats. There is a song growing in my waves we have not heard before. Listen. 
It speaks their names. The podcast is also told very creatively. We have <coughs> a spoken word artist, Aaliyah Pierce, who's also a National Geographic explorer, to imagine what the journeys for the Africans who were lost might have been. So that's our way of giving voice to them. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about another mission. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think that element, that personal element of the work we do is something that often gets left out of most scientific research. And it's so key and critical. Um, I haven't shared this publicly, but when I was working on the Clotilda, I got a text message from my mother that said, you know, your grandfather's buried in Alabama. And I had no connection to Alabama prior to working on this ship. And that led me down an entire other rabbit hole of tracing my own history and my own family. So I encourage you all as young folks, as scientists, as researchers, as alum, to go back and actually figure out what kind of personal connections you all have to the work you do, um, some of which you may not actively realize uh, coming out. But this brings me to another element that I know is critical here to the institution, and that's this relationship between ecology and the human experience. And this is actually the focus of my research, even though I do all those other things on the underwater and in between. Uh, but I became really concerned uh, in exploring this idea of what were the ecological and environmental impacts of the transatlantic slave trade. And we're in an interesting space now where we're going outside the boundaries of archaeology. So I often tell people these disciplinary boundaries are just meant to be guideposts, and then you're meant to dance around them, push them aside, go above them, go under them and explore until we get to these critical questions that can't be answered with just one way. Um, so in 2018, I hosted a conference with my colleagues where we brought archaeologists literally from all over the world to talk about the work that they had been doing uh, trying to understand the environmental impacts of the slave trade. We know from the transatlantic slave trade, we had massive old growth forests in the United States and beyond that were deforested to build these ships that went on the transatlantic voyage. We had massive clear cutting that occurred to establish these plantations massive terraforming to flatten the lands for these plantations. Uh, and we had people coming with their own ecological knowledges from parts of West Africa, blending with indigenous people here on this side of the Atlantic, and mixing all of that together to then think of new ways in which people were interacting uh, with their environments. So most of my work now focuses in the Danish West Indies at a place called the Estate Little Princess. And the Estate Little Princess is an 18th century Danish plantation in the Virgin Islands. Uh, very few people understand that the Danes were actually actively involved in the slave trade and had colonies in the Americas as well. So our current U.S. Virgin Islands are formerly the Danish West Indies, and there's a whole history we can go into uh, to speak about that as well. But what really got me is when I went to St. Croix, or traditionally known as I.I. for the first time, I, I went to this plantation with my colleague, Dr. Ayanna Flewellen. We talked about doing excavations here, and I looked at the buildings. And in the buildings, I saw these coral skeletons in these buildings. And in talking to people who lived on the island, they said, you know, we don't have a lot of good rock for building construction. So during the colonial period, enslaved Africans were tasked with free diving and mining the coral out of the ocean to build these buildings. Um, I then went deeper into the research and found that there are, there's a whole history of enslaved Africans being tasked as free divers to mine coral, to actually salvage shipwrecks and beyond. And it was sort of an apprentice tradition. Um, it actually got to the point where some people were able to buy their freedom uh, with the amount of work that they were doing. Uh, it was also very dangerous and very violent. Um, some individuals would intentionally blow out their eardrums so they wouldn't have to equalize every time they went down. Mm. Again, this is free diving, so we're not talking about scuba. So it was a very intense experience. I wanted to try to find a way to tell that story in addition to begin to explore and potentially quantify uh, the work that, that happened in terms of the relationship between land and the ocean. So I'm working now with a colleague of mine at Georgia Tech. Uh, we're actually doing um, some more in-depth work to understand the taxa of coral that are used in these buildings to compare it to the taxa of coral that currently exists off St. Croix today uh, to perhaps get a better understanding of, of how all of that changed uh, and then getting more understanding of coral mining and what it actually entailed and what it looked like. But the environmental impacts expand beyond just the ocean uh, in terms of mining and actually go even deeper. Uh, we know that massive plantation agriculture required lots of fertilizers. It required terraforming of land, which led to increased erosion, which also led to algae plumes, which led to lack of oxygen, fish die-offs, coral reef die-offs, a whole host of environmental issues 
that arose from clear cutting an island and turning it into plantation lands. Uh, this right here is an image of the gas, which is actually burnt sugarcane. Uh, they deforested the island to the extent that they had to start burning sugarcane waste to fuel the, the boiling pots when they were refining sugar. Um, so we're talking about massive terraforming and environmental transformation. In addition to the, the quote-unquote non-native animals and the plant species that were being introduced to the Caribbean, as well as the indigenous plants and animals that have now gone extinct. So all of this is just scratching the surface in one island in an area and an issue and a conversation that we need to continue to have, um, not only for understanding what we mean when we say conservation, what are we conserving to, uh, but also when we have conversations around this topic of reparations and what are we actually trying to repair. Um, there's a whole environmental ecological angle and I think some of our colleagues will, will talk about that as well. So looking forward to that. And this is an interesting component too, I think, uh, you know, Tara and I have been going back and forth trying to think through this process. As researchers, we're often taught, do the research, get the data, publish the information. But what do we do beyond that? What is our role? What is our responsibility? And we've had in-depth conversations about how do we then memorialize the transatlantic slave trade and what does that look like? Um, and I could talk a little bit about how we're thinking of it from an archeological angle, but I don't know if you want to touch a bit about about how you sort of developed your thoughts around it and what that's meant. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. And I like, he's so brilliant. <laughs> to have a moment um, of appreciation yeah. for your research and the way that you're thinking about the transatlantic slave trade and how we really can examine it in new ways. It's so important. Yeah. Like, had anybody really thought about it in the way that, no, yeah. right? <laughs> never mentioned, right? Never mentioned, that's true, that's yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's why this work is, uh, so can you hear me with this one? This is better. Okay. So that's why this work is, is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really helps us understand who we are, where we are, and where we're going. One of the other things that is, has become really important and surprising about this work, like you might think, oh, this is sad work. They're going down there looking for slave ships, and we know what happened on the slave ships that wrecked. Like, there was an enormous uh, loss of life. But what I found, and I think, Justin, you might agree with this, I have found two things. One, <coughs> when I've been underwater and I've encountered an artifact, like, of course, I know the story of that artifact now, and there definitely is some sadness around knowing what happened, but I think more than anything, I've felt a sense of power, a sense of agency, because I am, he is, we are raising our hands and we're saying that we're not going to wait for somebody who doesn't look like us and who doesn't prioritize this history to then decide it's important and put it in a history book. No, we can raise our hands and we can do the work. And we can bring this work back into memory. So it has felt so powerful to do that. And I think it's really important to look. This is another brilliant thing that Justin has said that I don't always attribute him to. <laughs> Actually, he and Ayana, his um, you co know, co-conspirators <laughs> say, say this. But there is power in looking. Mm. I think with this quote unquote difficult history, that is often um, approached through emotion. Like there's a lot of anger, shame, blame, like all of the emotions that prevent us from actually looking at it. But when you actually look at something, that's how you get to the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Like there's not a doctor in this world that would try to treat a wound that you have without actually looking at it mm -hmm. and then examining it to decide how to fix it. So through this work of looking, like honestly looking, and then acknowledging, not hiding, not erasing, not um, pretending like it wasn't as bad as it was, but really looking at it with eyes wide open, you can move through it. So I also think that that gives you an opportunity for healing. And I just want to tell a brief story about um, this picture that you have here. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of, um, it's work that's happening on a ship that's called the Sao Jose Paquette de Africa. 
and it's a ship that went down in South Africa. It was a Mozambican ship, and it was a, Port a Portuguese ship that was headed to Brazil. So that's another thing, like I didn't know that East Africa was involved in the slave trade to that extent, mm -hmm. but there were between 500,000 to a million Africans that were shipped off of the coast of Mozambique Island. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I um, but anyway, so this, um, this ship goes around the coast, headed to Brazil, and it wrecks in South Africa. Um, the team that worked on it, the Slave Wrecks Project, found the ship in 2015, and they identified where it came from, <coughs> Mozambique. So they identified the ethnic group that was most likely in the cargo hold, and it was a group of people called the Makua. So the team, when they, they found out who it was, they decided to bring word of what happened to that ship back to the Makua descendants. So they go back to Mozambique, and they have a celebration. So the descendants um, throw this, this big thing where there's, there's music, there's dance, and they are celebrating the fact that they finally know what happened to some of their ancestors. Um, and I want to play this one clip for you from um, Lonnie Bunch, who is, it's Lonnie Bunch and Kamau. Kamau's the gentleman in the picture here. Um, I'll just set up the clip, but Lonnie is the uh, founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and he was, w he was on the team that uh, went back. So the Makua chief hands Lonnie a cowrie shell basket, and this clip, I think the clip then explains what happens next. When I was asked to come up and stand next to the chieftain, he basically looked at me and said, his ancestors have asked. And then he said, no, his ancestors have begged that I do a favor. And he said, and we have this gift for you. He had gathered some soil from the community and this cowrie shell covered basket. And he called him forward and told Dr. Bunch in a very powerful way, that this is the soil from our community. I want you to take this soil to that wretched space where that ship went down, let our ancestors know that we are still here. And in a sense, I want you to bring those people back home. And so I'm looking at this beautiful cowrie shell encrusted vessel, just gleaming whiteness. And when I opened it, it was full of dirt. And I remember <coughs> thinking, Okay, I'm not clear what this is. Why is this a gift? What did his ancestors ask? And then he sort of teared up and said that his ancestors have asked that when I go back to South Africa where the ship was, if I could sprinkle the soil over the site of the wreck so for the first time since 1794, my people can sleep in their own land. I lost it. I'm crying. I'm trying to not sort of, you know, drop the drop the the vessel, and I'm just thinking about the contradictions, the beauty that surrounds me, the fact that I'm a historian, but this is about what li how living people feel and think, and to have this this vessel, it it almost was as if I was holding an iron weight. It was so heavy. It wasn't heavy. But Do you it think it matters to know that kind of history, think, where we came from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, it was in listening to that narrative, to experiencing the Clotilda, to watching what Tara was doing, that I began to reconceptualize this whole idea of archaeology and said that we're no longer doing archaeology. We've expanded beyond the confounds of archaeology. We're now recovering ancestral memory. And I literally sat with that. This is work that we're doing, recovering ancestral memory from people of African descent, but there's ancestral memory from people from Ireland, from people from China, from people from Japan. This land has ancestral memory attached to it. What is the responsibility we have when we do that? We have to do the research. We also have to do the repair. And that's what got 
me and Dr. Ayanna Fluellen and, and others thinking about what do we do beyond archaeology now that we're starting to explore these questions. We know of the environmental impacts that have happened from the transatlantic slave trade. We don't know the full degree yet. Is it possible to rectify it? Probably not. It's an impossibility. It's like you drop a vase, it's in a million pieces. You could get glue and glue it all back together, but it's not going to be the same vase. So what can we do? One potential idea we have is what we're calling an archaeology of redress. So now, in addition to doing the excavations for six weeks every year while we bring students and train them, we're also talking about doing coral restoration alongside with it. Understanding that we're not going to be able to plant and continue to grow every species of coral that has been devastated, but we begin to add a little drop into this ocean. And most importantly, it begins to change the mentality. And I think that's the most critical thing that we often lose when we do this research. The transatlantic slave trade occurred because of a mentality. Restoration occurs because of a mentality. How we interact with one another and the ocean is a mentality. And we have the ability to shift that by actively engaging people in this work. And so I think that's a critical component that we can begin to look more closely in. I could go down some of the, the key highlights that the Nature Conservancy puts out in terms of why coral is important. It's over 500 million years old. It supports roughly 29% of marine life. Roughly 90% of the world's reefs have died over the last 40 years. That statistic was so crazy for me to hear. I had to research it three, four times just to make sure I got these numbers right. 90% of the world's reefs have died over the last 40 years. And that's been a host of issues from climate change, which is the most important one, to runoff and pollution, to diver impact, to overfishing, uh, and to other snorkeler impact uh, as well. But all of these things we're now bringing together to reconceptualize what it is we do and how we do it. And Tara's work has told us that there's a whole storytelling component to every project that we do that becomes central and critical to that. And I don't know if you want to elaborate on it further, and then we can open it for questions yeah, after. Yeah, we can open it up to questions, but I, I just want to say this one last thing. Um, you talked about the future and mm. where we're going. And what's exciting is that people are open. Um, young people are excited about this work and want to be involved. I even, um, I want to, I'm going to play a last clip, and yeah, that'll be sure. like the walk off. Um, <laughs> but this clip is of it's me talking to my nieces about this work, and I want you to hear what they say. Mm. Do you think um, it matters to know that kind of history, where we came from? I'm here with my nieces, Wu and Shai, trying to be the conduit for them that my ancestors have been for me. We're learning from each other. I think it matters. I think it's pretty cool. But let me ask you this. Do you know that your ancestors, like way, way, way back, came from Africa? Mm, Did no. you know that? Yes, mm. I did know that, that my ancestors came from Africa. Do you guys know about the work I'm doing? The history of the slave ships and about your family. Yeah. I'm following these divers as they search for slave shipwrecks. So what do y'all think about that? I think that's pretty cool. You get to explore more about the world and you get to learn more stuff that you didn't already know. And I think that's cool. Do you care about that history? Like knowing all that far back? It's awesome. It's cool, like, when you get older, you'll be able to tell people that, yeah, this cool aunt, and she did all this stuff, and she got to explore the world. <laughs> I wish I could do it, but I still got school to finish up, which is boring. Because <laughs> if I didn't have school, I would have been doing one, of course. Will, will y'all come scuba diving with me one day? Yes, yes I will. Yes, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. Yes, she will. All right. <laughs> This is what he's saying instead of Obama's and yes I can. It's yes we will. Yes. <laughs> That's it. That's the future. <laughs> <laughs> And the sun is out, the rain has stopped, and we have individuals walking around with microphones. For anybody who would like to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, yeah, we could talk more about any element of it. Yep. Uh, 
we consolidated with what we had at South Carolina and I'm trying to return to Bacon Beach or what what is some of the existing business out there? Yeah. Uh I can speak a little bit about it and you can go deeper. I yeah, I can yeah. still talk. Yeah. So we um the Slave Rex project and the Smithsonian excavated that ship before I even got involved. Uh, that was roughly 10 years ago now, probably. Um, many of those artifacts are sitting in um, conservation tanks at Iziko Museums in South Africa. Uh, as for those of you who know underwater archaeology, a lot of the iron gets corroded, so they literally have to put it into a saltwater bath, shoot electrodes into it, break up the rust, and then eventually get the original object as close to what it looked like. Um, so that is a multi-year, often decade-long process. So they're still sitting in those baths uh, while we're looking at those individual pieces. I don't know if they've officially published what they have found, um, but uh, I do know that there has been um, elements of shackles that have been recovered. Um, and I don't know much else beyond that. But I think wood pieces, um, some of the artifacts are also in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Mm -hmm. But, and, and you would speak to this, um, Justin, the, the goal often with this work is not to bring mm -hmm. things up. So there's a conversation about what remains. Um, yeah, so you might wanna. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, delicate balance when we do maritime archeology. span uh, Conservation is so expensive and so extensive that we often feel our best duty is just to record as much as possible and leave things in place. Uh, we tell people archaeology is one of the few sciences that destroys its data as we recover it. <laughs> so we are very conscious about what we excavate, how we excavate, and how we conserve. Um, but if you go to the African American Museum in the basement, you will see the ballast, uh, the iron ballasts uh, that were used to counterbalance the weight on the ship um, that are there right now. <laughs> and you guys both were amazing today. I was uh, busting out in tears <laughs> and off the team. Um, but um, uh, I'm really curious, you mentioned, uh, someone mentioned a statistic about like 12 million cubic feet miles of ocean mm. that's now out there. I'm curious about how do you even start looking for some of these artifacts? Like with the amount of ocean that we have, mm. the volume of the water, it kind of looks like a needle in a haystack. What does that first step look like? Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, you got to go for it. Yeah, <laughs> let's see how your archaeologist goes. <laughs> yeah, he is the resident archaeologist. <laughs> um, but I'll just say this, that uh, the, the, the work really starts in the archives. Um, and surprisingly, there are a lot of archival records about these wrecks. Uh, most of the wrecks, you know, were expensive endeavors. So they had financial backers, and a lot of the financial backers required the ships to have insurance. So they had insurance on them. And you all know what happens when you have to put in an insurance claim, the insurance company investigates. So that's what would happen with these wrecks, and the insurance companies have detailed records on their investigations. So you've got the, the captain's records, crew manifests, often their court um, records because some of these cases end up in court. Mm -hmm. So historians are major um, partners inside of this work. It's archeologists, it's historians, it's divers. Like the three of them are like a trifecta yeah. <laughs> making things happen. Um, so that's one way to begin to narrow it down. And then all, you know, once the, the records indicate a location, that's when um, divers get involved and equipment like magnetometers and sonar scans are used <laughs> to look for anomalies on the ocean floor. Once those anomalies are found, then th you have to go and dive each one of them to see what's really there. Mm -hmm. So archeologists and divers are a part of that process. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, also communities hold a vast amount of knowledge. And I think that's something that we often overlook uh, but I think case in point, Costa Rica is probably one of the best cases. And Tara knows a lot more about Costa Rica than, than I do. But there's two slave shipwrecks that were located off the coast of Costa Rica. And those communities have known for centuries that they are descendants of people who came from those shipwrecks that made their way into Costa Rica and lived together with the Bribri uh, and have set up communities that are African indigenous communities that exist in these areas of Costa Rica. And you actually got to see that wreck, I believe. Yeah, do you want to talk about that a bit? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much time we have. Like, how are we doing? <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Okay. Okay. Through your presentation of today. Uh -huh. Thank you for your presentation. It Thank was you. extraordinarily inspirational to me personally. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to ask you support versus resistance. Mm. Think about the New York Times and the 1619 project. Mm -hmm. About are we gonna look at history? Yeah. Are we going yeah. to really look at it? Yeah. Right. I'm curious what your experience. Yeah. Yeah. Do you wanna pick it up and go for it? We're always like, which yeah. one? <laughs> <laughs> go for it. So, with my storytelling, the storytelling that has happened inside of National Geographic, um, so we put out the podcast. We also, um, the March issue features this story, and I plug myself for five seconds. Yeah. I'm on the cover of the magazine. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fir I'm the first black woman storyteller to be, a first black woman explorer to be on the cover of National Geographic magazine. Yeah. Um, My mom got like 10 copies, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. <laughs> But what we found with the story, with the podcast, is actually an overwhelming curiosity and interest. And I'm not sure if it's because our approach is a bit of a unique approach. Like we're coming to the story through exploration, through adventure, through science. Um, so right now, we're experiencing openness around that. But I take your point uh, very much, and mm -hmm. it is a very fraught environment um, where there's a lot of pushback on new ideas or new discoveries or new conversations or interpretations about history. Um, but I can tell you that National Geographic is really committed to not being dissuaded by any of those conversations and going forward. And we're looking at even more work in the space because we think it's really important. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, and that's a critical point, um, especially with these conversations around critical race theory and what is allowed and not allowed to be taught in classes. Um, one of the beauties of it, somebody asked me like, how do you, a similar question, how do you deal with resistance? And I told them I don't, I just ignore it. <laughs> because we have so many other outlets now where we don't have to get into your textbook, we can get into your TV screen, on your iPad, <laughs> on your cell phone, in your newspaper. Yes. And those are the ways that we begin to explore it. Um, and I think that that is also, it's critical to understand that, but then it's also understanding like just how much work needs to be done. Um, we've only talked about the African diaspora. We're working with our colleagues at the Indigenous Archaeology Collective, talking about how to get them scuba certified to start diving on indigenous sites. And that's a whole other conversation that has just barely scratching the surface. And now I teach at UCLA, which means I get 60 fresh minds every <laughs> semester that I can talk to and convince them to study their own history underwater and beyond. So it's, it's at a point now it's unstoppable. And so they're just going to have to either hop on board or, <laughs> or get out the way. <laughs> but thank you for that. Yeah, the countries have been very receptive. Um, oftentimes with the coral restoration, we'll attach ourselves and offer ourselves as assistance to existing programs so we don't reinvent the wheel. Um, St. Croix specifically, the Nature Conservancy has been doing great work. A number of community organizations have been doing great work there. Um, but we also are realizing coral restoration is specific to St. Croix for us because of the coral mining. We've been thinking and talking about Africa Town and the Clotilda. The Clotilda was financed by a slave owner who was using enslaved people to cut down old growth forests in Alabama. So restoration there might actually look like forest conservation. And so that's gonna be a whole other conversation with, with what that could look like. Uh, but yeah, people have been, been very receptive uh, as we go into these places. 
And as soon as you tell people you're working with young people, all doors open up. Mm-hmm. All doors open. Yeah. And, but Justin, because we know that there could be like as many as 990 wrecks out there. Yeah, that's true. And we're not able to do missions everywhere yet. Yeah, that's true. Because you're like, the waters are owned by various entities mm-hmm. inside of countries and there's not always interest. Yeah, not always interest yeah. and political issues. Cuba has a large number of wrecks that we'd like to get into and I know that there's gonna be some political, some things that need to be navigated to get to that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you actually had your nieces trained on Good Morning America, I believe, uh, a bit ago. <laughs> yeah, the one of the beautiful things about Diving with a Purpose is that it has a youth component called Youth Diving with a Purpose. So it's young people as young as 16, between 16 and 24, and they're taught this exact thing. Um, so, and uh, the members of YDWP were actually the the main divers on the Guerrero, um, looking for the or trying to look at the anomalies for the Guerrero, and that's a Spanish uh, ship that wrecked <coughs> off the coast of Key Largo. Mm-hmm. So there are definitely pathways, and to your point, um, it's an expensive sport. <laughs> You've got to have access to water, so it's not always accessible for people. Mm-hmm. But the founder of Diving with a Purpose, this amazing visionary gentleman named Ken Stewart, has created um, these pathways to diving. So first it starts with swimming. And we already know that there are barriers to swimming um, in African American communities. So he's beginning to solve that along with other organizations who've got swim training. So we get people trained as swimmers, and then we start to get them trained as divers. But the process is happening, and there are organizations that are trying to address that. Mm -hmm. And and we've got divers literally all age range. We've got divers in their 80s that continue to teach us how to dive and actually produce, like the map that you just saw, that was produced by an architect that that dives with us, uh, Miss Gail Patrick. I'm not going to say her full age because I don't want to get in trouble, but (laughs) we'll just say she's an octogenarian and she's still diving and still doing the work. So there's that full spectrum that occurs in that process. Yeah. <laughs> also, I had a quick question for you. Uh, you did your talk about needing what's next for the bridge mm. as it is moving forward. Yeah. You guys are going to hear from Jill Tiefenthaler uh, <laughs> on Wednesday, <laughs> who is the president of National Geographic Society, and that's the question that she keeps asking me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> ask me that in a month. <laughs> no, um, there are a lot more stories to be told. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, I think that there is a narrative to examine. Like there's a narrative about black people in this world that I, I think there's it's time for new parts of that. Like it's time for a new conversation. So I hope to be doing um, a lot more storytelling in this space, a lot more examination and telling new stories. That's code word for it's top secret, but we'll be (laughs) talking more about it later. (laughs) Can we give him a big round of applause? Thank you.
picture. I got to take a picture. <laughs> So, so awesome. Oh. Um, Into the Depths, that's the, the six-part series. Listen to it, it's really amazing. And I left saying to myself, I want to dive with them so bad. I want to <laughs> go, I want to go. But I also know that to change the story, you got to change the storyteller, right? And so I'm thinking personally, like, let them lead, yeah. But I want to... I want to be there too, you know, like, and I think the other way to do it is to change the old storytellers. And if old white guys like me are the old storytellers, like I can evolve and I can listen better and I can support and uh, follow your lead. But I, I definitely want to follow your lead. So thank you both so much for, for being here. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is invited right behind us to the Center for Human Ecology where we'll have cocktails and conversations and be here for tomorrow at 9.30, Tanasia Swift with the Billion Oyster Project. Definitely come back and thank you so much for coming out, surviving the rain and um, thank you. Have a good night.